All right. So it looks like we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of Shriner Life. Um, uh, tonight, I get to be the turn as host, uh, and we'll be hosting tonight's um, topic will be Character Corner. So we'll be talking about characters, influential characters, also character creation. Uh, so with me are uh, my co-host, Dr. Charlie Huber, Dean of Students. Hello. Dr. Dr. Matthew Goodwin, Assistant Dean of Students at Shriner. And uh, gamer extraordinaire and dungeon master um, uh, guru Alan Minter. Hello. Right, That's and me. from our esports team, and also recent winner of uh, the Muse Shriner University Literary um, Fiction Award is Zach Purcell. Hello. All right. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, influential characters throughout history also because we're all gamers in some form or fashion. Um, and so um, whether we're selecting characters on a screen or we're creating a character with our dice and a piece of paper, a sheet, um, we all have created characters uh, in the past too. And so we're going to talk a little bit about both, about character creation and about influential characters. But uh, I'm going to start with um, some of the influential characters I did in some of my research. Uh, and I found that uh, some of the top 10 um, most influential characters, fictional characters, and now some people believe these folks could be real, right? So you see Santa Claus right there. I know my kids believe Santa Claus is real, right? Um, but of all those, the top 10 that I found, this is according to um, Goliath.com. So if you guys uh, want to, you know, if you don't believe in that, <laughs> that website, let me know and we can argue and debate that now. But uh, so you see in the list there on the back the screen behind me is, uh, is Barbie. Uh, she was listed as number one. Santa Claus was listed as number two. Um, number three was Big Brother from 1984 uh, from George Orwell. And number four was Mickey, is Mickey Mouse. Number five is the Marlboro Man. Now, some of you guys might be too young to know who the Marlboro Man is out there, but super influential on the tobacco industry. Uh, number six is Dracula. Number seven is Uncle Sam right there oh, on this side. That's reverse things. It drives me nuts. <clears throat> number eight is Hamlet. Number nine was Robin Hood. And number 10 was Papa the Sailor Man. So first off, I just wanted to get you guys' uh, responses to, to that top 10 list, uh, debates or agreements, and go. Uh, I mean, I would agree with Barbie being on the list, but not necessarily at number one because a lot of young girls who uh, like to play with their Barbie toys, right? And a lot of, there's research that shows that, hey, they have some positive or negative body outlook because of either wanting to look like her, you know, there's just a lot on that subject. But I don't think she would necessarily be at number one since that's kind of a uh, higher, like first, first world kind of thing not necessarily something you would see in poor countries yeah you know i i, I see dracula and i guess it depends on influ when you define influential influence on what and i'm i struggle with barbie being on there i mean influence on toys maybe but influence on a, a generation of, of young girls but, i mean there have been other toys that have as fictional characters, but I mean, I think of there's so many out there, and I just, I don't know. I, I struggle with that. I see Mickey Mouse being on the list somewhere, Dracula for sure. You know those types of of characters, uh, but I mean, I don't know. I, there's so many more that I would want on the list and think should be on the list. Uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, I definitely don't think Barbie's number one. Even Uncle Sam. I mean. Maybe that list was made many years ago I, in the 80s. I don't see any. I mean, what about Harry Potter? I mean, or, you know, some more of the modern characters that have had influence on fiction. I mean, I, I Homer Simpson. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I can see those arguments. I think the Barbie probably has a lot to do because Barbie has been around so long and has been so influential. Like every little girl pretty much is handed a Barbie at some point growing up at least in the the western world but yeah. 
being that I'm neither female nor do I have daughters, I really feel like I may not be qualified to speak to that uh, specifically. I can understand how it probably would find its way at number one because it's been around for so long and influential, both, you know, perceived good and perceived bad different ways. Uh, you know, Dracula making the list. That's surprised me. I, I was a little surprised to hear the name associated with the list, but you know, you think back of that character uh, and, you know, Vom, you know, Stoker's story and like the history of it and, you know, actually being established from historic roots within a country based on the Impaler, right? Like there's a lot of history that goes within that character. So I can understand why, it, you know, makes a list. And then Popeye, um, I mean, cool. I mean, I, I watched growing up. I mean, cool guy. I, I immediately think Robin Williams, but you know, that's, that's me. <laughs> that's right. Wow. I, I desperately wanted to eat spinach when I was a kid because, you know, it would have made me stronger and have really big arms. Right. <laughs> that's right. Right. I think that was, uh, it must've been some, some mom made that up somewhere or our dad that was like, you know what? Kids need to eat these vegetables. This dude's mm-hmm. super strong. Maybe boys will eat vegetables now. I, it never worked on me. I hated spinach, but um, I think Barbie uh, is is so high because yes, she's been around for a long time. But think of all the different careers that that Barbie has had, right? There's a Barbie for everything, um, mm. and there's you know uh, when you know Barbie introduced the, I guess the the different jobs that she's had. You know, some of those were at the time jobs that most women wouldn't either a go for or b um would be allowed to have because of the glass ceiling i think it's one of the reasons that that argument is why they're so high Mm -hmm. as well as the ethnic diversity in the barbies right uh it took a while for them to get there but it it finally did and so you could basically find a barbie for just about anything that you're into uh nowadays uh but at santa claus i thought probably should have been number one uh because you think about how influential santa claus is on the entire world uh so i was glad that he was so high on the list uh, who surprised me though the most was uh, was Big Brother from George Orwell, mm. not because he's not influential the the character or the mindset of the government in the Big Brother, but just because I, I didn't think about that you know. Um, and this list, uh, yeah, I, I just found it as the first one I looked at mainly so we could get conversation started. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to see a little bit about our backgrounds of uh, of who's kind of thinks what, uh, so our listeners can get a good taste there. So moving from that one. Is, is the segue into what what character do you think has been uh, a large influence on you? And that could be from any media, so from uh, books to film, whatever. Uh, so looking back as, you know, maybe your top two or three characters who had a major influence on you and maybe why you did what you did, uh, or it molded you as to who you are today. And I don't know about the molding piece, but, you know, character-wise, you know, just – all the classic monsters that was a that's a big family connection for me my mom loves halloween like that's her thing uh the classic monsters growing up you know that was you know that's what we did we you know we we dressed up as yeah you know, i dressed up as dracula for multiple halloweens you know if you're like hey what am i gonna be this halloween you don't have any ideas i'm gonna go as dracula that's that's <laughs> that's kind of a go-to thing um fun characters you know funny enough the other night we uh we put on the movie a knight's tale and i realized how much that i probably didn't appreciate the movie growing up but now when i watch it it's become one of my favorite movies and uh jeffrey chauncer yeah. actually became an inspiration for a character that i developed that you'll probably hear about later in the show <laughs> but love that character within within the that movie uh specifically um yeah, and there's just so many other characters out there that I that I like, you know, kind of fit that mold, um, you know, kind of the uh, the cowboy, you know, Indiana Jones growing up was a huge character, right? I at one point I wanted to be Indiana Jones, I wanted to be an archaeologist, and I soon realized that you didn't get to do exactly in real life what he did in the movies, so um, that kind of took a back seat. But um, you know, growing up that was a huge influence you know, of seeking out, constructing, um, you know, being able to take something and find something or, or make something, uh, you know, different characters like that, I tend to, to gravitate towards. Anybody else? <laughs> Probably a tough question. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I struggled with this question quite a bit, just kind of 
trying to think of everything that has influenced me over the years. I guess looking back, probably Star Wars being a huge part. Was I was born in 76, so it was like right prime age to just be absorbed by that. And of course, with that, Luke Skywalker was a big influence in my younger years. Uh, can't even begin to gauge how many hours and days and weekends I spent playing in that universe, either in my head or with other friends with you know action figures and things like that. But just kind of the, as you get older, it gets more complicated. You get to learn about the mythos and the philosophy behind the, the Jedi Order. And you either agree or disagree. As I've gotten older, I've realized I probably would not be the best Jedi. <laughs> Go figure. Um, You're right. <laughs> um, but other than th that, uh, but Indiana Jones, yeah, of course, was great for adventuring and um, trying to think recent years, probably <laughs> as much as I hate to admit it, probably Rick Sanchez just kind of amplified my nihilistic tendencies. But yeah, like, always a good time to be had, good conversations with those uh, those characters in mind. I'm pretty sure I'd find myself in the gray Jedi order if that's mm -hmm. if that's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> you know, I would um I'm wearing the shirt. I think Superman was one of those characters that I was always sort of <clears throat> the idea of Superman more than uh you know, as a fictional character, it, you know, and has he developed really into the the Boy Scout. And so there I always kind of wanted to be like that. And so that had a huge, in, a huge influence on me, even as a kid reading the comic books. And, um, you know, back in those the, the late 80s, early 90s Superman era comics, I mean, he was, he was just a Boy Scout. And, and it, they tried to add depth to him and they couldn't, and it, and it didn't matter to me. I liked him anyway. Uh, there's another character uh, from a, a book called The Spell for a Chameleon. Uh, the main character in that bink is uh, one of those characters that had an influence. I mean, I, I think I've read that book and it's it's almost children's literature now and I've read it since then, but it's a story if you, a uh, world of Xanth, everybody has magic and this guy's getting kicked out of his home because he doesn't have magic and he's on a quest to find out what his, mad if he has magic and the whole book's really about that. And so I've read it, it's the one book I've read multiple times. I've, you know, I've read a lot of books and I've read a few books twice. I, I think there's only, that may be the only book I've read more than five times. And so in my life and, and because the, I like the story so much and I like that character um, because he's, he almost doesn't fit in. And in the end he fits in better than anyone, uh, but he had to find that for himself and he had to, and he has to live with that. And it's uh, an interesting develop and the way that, that character's developed in that book is pretty interesting. There's another story by the same author. Uh, um, it's called On a Pale Horse. It's part of the seven books, the incarnations of immortality. And uh, the first book, really, that character, he becomes death. And it is, he's, he's on the, he's about to commit suicide at the beginning of the book. And uh, he ends up sort of becoming death in that path. And it's, it's, his his character is just really deep and really uh, torn throughout the book, uh, but anyway, that, those those kind of characters are have always been interesting to me. Of course, Star Wars. I mean, we were all grew up with Star Wars. That was what we did, and so we always wanted to be a Jedi. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't understand why Han Solo wasn't a Jedi. <laughs> he was cooler than all the Jedi, <laughs> but. Right. Uh, you know, I think those just so many of those characters have influenced me in, in my life. And then there's the Tom Sawyer Huckleberry Finn too, you know, as a kid growing up in the wild. I could go on and on. <laughs> Thought of a few more of those shows, right? You had the A Team, right? Yeah. I mean, Hannibal Lecter, Face, you know, and then they had uh, the Knight Rider, right? And then you had. Yeah. Uh, Big Giver was a big one for me. I don't oh, know. Oh yeah, Tyler. yeah. But I was oh, so. I used to glue random stuff together all the time because of MacGyver. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna solve this problem with a, a paper clip, a rubber band, and bubble gum. Let's That's get it. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think I took that to heart. Still today, if I I'll try to find a way to make something work with what I have around me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think, Zach? 
Well, I can agree with y'all on Star Wars. Uh, being born at in 2001, right when the prequels were coming out, right that became a big part of my life. Uh, it was mainly the original three, though. So Han Solo was actually one of my biggest one of the biggest characters that I was like, wow, I want to be like him. Just always smooth, there to save the day, you know, kind of a devil may care attitude. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. I want to be like him. Awesome. Cool. For me growing up, um, <clears throat> it was those characters that were not the, the, the big heroes, right? I was um, I like the characters that are behind the scenes type of a thing. So in literature, it was always uh, Samwise Gamgee was my favorite character, um, just because he was the guy that really, if there was no Sam, like everybody fails, right? Uh, Frodo doesn't get the ring put over there. Uh, you know, he's the encourager. He's the guy that's behind the scenes, you know, helping push the hero to where the hero needs to be. Or uh, when it came to, to Star Wars, my favorite character was R2-D2, right? So he was the guy that was always, he was always there and he saved their butt so many times. Uh, if it wasn't for him, there, there's no Star Wars, especially when the prequels come out, you know, because they didn't save Anakin and Padme on the, on the ship to begin with. There's no Star Wars at all, right? So those characters always I felt identified with and I think kind of make me who, who I am today because I like to be that behind the scenes guy. Um, I like to get credit when, you know, when people notice that, but when I work with my students or whatever in SAB or, or Greek life or esports, I want them to, I want to be able to give them the tools and then kind of push them a little bit. And then they get all the credit for it uh, being an amazing uh, event or are doing well in, in their competitions or whatever. And so I like being that guy um, that's back there and knows everything that's going on. Um, so it's, I'm, we, we, joke all the time about the duck on the water, right, in student services, and uh, we're always the feet, right, student, uh, the SAB or the the leaders that we are, we're kind of, we're churning the water, you know, and then every, you know, the event's nice and smooth. I think later in life, um, over the last couple of years, I think one of my favorite characters uh, who I feel I also identify with, I want to be more like, um, right, is this guy right here, which is Sam Jackson, in his portrayal of Nick Fury, um, ever since the, the Iron Man, went, I mean, he knows everything. He knows all the behind the scenes and he's putting all the dots together um, and he's making, he's setting everybody up for success. So I, so I kind of feel like uh, I like Nick a whole lot too. Uh, so those are my, obviously Star Wars too. And I um, was big. I wanted to be a Jedi. Um, I was more of a Luke guy than a Han Solo guy, right? Because I was like the nice guy or whatever. Um, and, uh, and so I always want to kind of be more like him. And then later on, it's it's uh, my favorite Star Wars guy is Obi-Wan Kenobi outside of R2. So kind of like the way he was portrayed in the pre prequels. He's probably the best character in all those three films. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so those are, those are my influential characters. All right. So shifting gears a little bit, right? Now, this is a part that probably Matt's excited about. Um, but uh, <laughs> we all play games, uh, whether it's D&D &D or uh, – esports or whatever and so we're all familiar with creating characters whether we're writing them or we're playing them so when you create a character what is the most important to you in creating that character and then how do you draw your inspiration for your character creation <laughs> so i'll start because my answer might be the shortest i don't know i i think that um, so I was actually reading, uh, I, I found one of my brother's scripts uh, this morning uh, called Blood Letters. And it's about our family. You know, all the character names are changed. And so when you say, so I'm going to answer this sort of out of order. Uh, I think the best characters are developed uh, based on real experiences. You know, I think of comedy and all of this and the best comedians, they they're able to take their own lives and display them in such a way that it's entertaining. Um, I think some of the best literature ha is grounded in people you know. Um, so for me in character development, that's important. I, I, th I think we all have rich uh, experiences that we can draw from if we're just creative in how we draw from that uh, and share it. And so I think uh, you get influenced by other authors, you get influenced by books that you've read but I, I often think the best inspiration for character development comes from your own life. And the, whether it's your kids, whether it's your 
family, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, or crazy neighbors. Uh, uh, I think for me, it's that. Um, and I don't, to me, if it doesn't have uh, dragons or magic in it or, or some sort of special powers, it, it's pointless. But uh, that's just always been my sort of take on it. I, I, in the in the fantasy realm, um, but I think there's still there's still a lot you can draw from the those around you. I'll jump in. So, man, when making characters, uh, I mean, the simplest stat, charisma, has to be off off the chain. Like it's got to be beyond ridiculous. Uh, for any pretty much character that I like to play. Um, I think the inspiration for that comes from, you know, growing up, you know, I'm, I'm initially an introverted person, uh, but introverted in the, in the sense, you know, not, not that people think of like, well, you're quiet, you don't talk. Uh, and the fact that it drains me, it takes a lot of energy for me to do those types of things. So when making a character, you know, kind of what Dr. Huber is saying, you know, influence from life, uh, I'm playing a character in a way that I can't be in real life, right? You know, the, the, the attributes, uh, you know, maybe it's something I feel I have, but I can't uh, project it in that way or do it all the time, you know, or, say, or things like that. So, you know, in like D&D or other role-playing games and things like that, I'm typically playing a character who, um, you know, not that I want to be like, but uh, different aspects of you know myself or maybe different aspects of different things that I can en enhance and just make kind of ridiculous uh, you know over over the top uh, you know kind of out large type of characters um, so for me that that charisma part is pretty important um, you know the, the life experience pulling in from you know everything you know when I sit down to think through a character you know I almost build a story around the idea of the character first Right. And then because for me, that's that's kind of the more important piece, like how are how am I going to connect to this person if I'm playing the person? Uh, how you know, how are others going to perceive this person or our type of character if it's if it's a monster or, or whatever it might be? And then build the story kind of around that uh, or be placed within a certain circumstances and I get to react to it. And like I, I love doing that, too, or the, the character almost comes first and you just kind of have to negotiate and navigate the world around it as it's coming to to the, that character but um yeah for me uh charisma uh, on top of everything else um is kind of my go-to of what i'm most interested in um uh but I, I think that just comes from me in in my desire of wanting to be able to do to be really good at that in real life and still having to work on that you know, so when it's kind of in a gameplay situation and uh, there's no real pressure there, you can kind of be ridiculous and over the top with it. Yeah, uh, I can, I agree with you. Charisma is a great stat to have, especially in D&D, because you can get away with anything at any time, as long as you have it. Uh, the thing that I look, that I like in my characters would be the intelligence that just because uh i grew up with sherlock holmes right and he was like with intelligence you can beat anyone or anything right you don't need to have guns or swords or anything as long as you're smart you can figure anything out no matter what and i keep that in my own life also unlike you uh where you do kind of the opposite of what you have i like to bring in my own like reflect what i think i have which would be that intelligence of hey let's do this smart and not brute force uh the quote i like to attribute is brute force can kick down a door but knowledge is a skeleton key so that's good yeah. that's really good those are great answers. Um, I feel that I, I've definitely gone down each of those roads. Uh, but with character creation, I it's very situational, in my opinion. It depends on kind of what mood you're in, uh, what game you're playing, what the needs of the game are. 
I think a lot of times when you're going into, I guess I, I, that was the, the answer, the question, right? What, what characters do you like to create for games or is it just in general? Yeah, games in general, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, with that, I know some people, they're wanting to basically just hack and slash and murder the way across a map. That's all they want to go to the gaming table for. And other people are there for the intrigue and for the puzzles and the, the, the traps. And people like the, the who need the charisma. They they need to be the face man of the group to, to negotiate and to BS and find <laughs> a way to get around the problem instead of just going straight through it. And those are all great. And sometimes people are just wanting, they want to challenge themselves. So they want to be actors. So they come up with this crazy idea, like this is the character that I want to play. We're going to throw them into whatever environment the DM puts in, on the table. And that is their acting prompt for that's either that campaign or for that session, depending on, on what is going on. Um, for me personally, I tend to look at what does the game need? Um, is this something that also how serious is this game going to be? Is this going to yeah. be a weekly, <laughs> like we're playing every Thursday night at 7 p.m.? Nobody's allowed to miss unless you're in, unless it's like your own funeral or something versus like, we're going to play a couple times a month if we can get around to it. Sorry guys, but we're all busy or we have, you know, adult things to do. So that kind of tailors kind of what kind of game you're going to play, what kind of character you're going to create to go into that game. And I don't think there's really a wrong answer as long as everybody's having fun. Yeah, I'll agree with that for sure. I think, um, it's funny because you described like you know, at least two of our party <laughs> that we're playing currently in D and D. I'm not going to say any names, but um, we all know who they are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think for for me, the when it when it yeah, it depends on what I'm doing. So uh, every character that I do, whether I'm writing um, a story, a short story, or I'm playing D and D, or I'm trying to pick a character for a video game. I always wanted to have a real deep backstory and the backstory means a whole lot to me. Um, and I may, I want to make sure that um, my DM, if I'm playing that way, knows all the backstory that they can about my character. Right. Cause there's always, uh, there's always a lot of tragedy usually in my characters uh, that makes them who they are. There's a reason they have to do what they do. Uh, I don't think any of the characters I've ever made have had parents um, that survived, <laughs> I guess, past them being 10 years old. Uh, so there's always that they're looking for a father figure or they're looking for um, uh, guidance or whatever to, for someone to tell them that, hey, you've, you've made it. You're, you've become a man. You've become a warrior. You're at whatever level you need to be. I think it's super interesting uh, to have a character that has lots of conflict uh, within themselves as well as probably within the party. So no matter what situation I go into, it's, oh, it's always a character like that. Um, but if I just think about stats, you know, if you guys are talking about stats, I think mine would always have to be dex um, or, or maybe strength, right? Depending <laughs> on which character I'm playing, I have a couple of them um, that are look at both those stats quite a bit. So I'm, I am the guy that runs in a lot of times and just smashes and doesn't think about what it is they're going to do because uh, for a lot of the time, it's it's cathartic for me, right? So it's why I play Dungeons and Dragons because there's things I can do there that I can't do in real life because <laughs> you get arrested for it. Um, but it's like playing outside the uh, outside the rules and, and breaking the rules sometimes. Uh, it's why I enjoy the game so much. So that shifts us over to the next question. <laughs> Matt's, Matt's cheesing so big over there. Uh, who's your favorite character you've ever created? <laughs> I'll go. I know. Yep. <laughs> I, think, I can play him a lot. Uh, so uh, it's a D&D &D character. It's called Fableton. He's a, a gnome, a uh, bard, uh, and then you throw in there as a, a gladiator. And that's just more for the storytelling piece. He's convinced himself he's a gladiator. Um, but I have a lot of fun playing this character. I take on a crazy accent. Uh, it was the first character I've ever I ever developed playing D and D, uh, and I kind of just let loose with and bringing in a whole bunch of different experiences and different influences from different people. Jeffrey Chaucer from that movie, uh, Kilgrave. Like the, I wanted this character to be a very chaotic, neutral type of character to allow him to go in a lot of different directions. 
So I get to talk like this all the time when I like to play that character. And he gets so excited because he gets to influence people and talk to them and try to make them do different things that they want them to do. And he, he's just he's just that type of bubbly, over the top type of character. You know, we're gonna run in and try to take down a dragon. He's gonna say, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me go first and see if we can make this dragon our friend, and then we can ride him out of here to our next destination. Right? I mean, that's that's just who. Uh, this character is and I have a lot of fun playing them because um, you know it's obviously over the top things that I can't do in real life right but uh, the negotiation and the talking and you know where there's a will kind of there's a way uh, is kind of how I play this character even though it might be way outside the lines and left field of like that's not even we sh why are you even attempting to talk to that red dragon he's going to kill us well, I mean, I'm pretty sure I can convince him to do what we want him to do, right? Like, he's got that kind of mindset, uh, and he's, he's just going to try it. But he's also pretty confident because he got people behind him that he knows that, like, if he can't get through it and maybe rolls that that one roll, <laughs> um, he can quietly sneak into the background, and there's someone there to kind of back him up and come forward, and then he's going to shout from the shadows at that point of, you know, the insults and things. So uh, that's my favorite character. Um, it comes out a lot in different other characters that, I mean, apparently that that's my go-to. Um, I've tried to make other characters in like the D and D world, uh, or try to be drawn to like the other heavy hitter characters. I just don't enjoy it. Uh, I, I need to be the, uh, the charismatic, uh, chaotic person who's going to walk into a bar in D and D and you know if he wants to start a fight he's gonna go talk to this person and talk to that person the adult talk to that person and sit in the back and kind of watch it all kind of unfold it just it's just um you know i like to create that chaos in, in that way uh playing that character um but he's very active i feel like when i play a character or my favorite characters are very active and influential to circumstances that you find yourself in right? He's always going to be a part of what's happening. It might be good. It might be bad. He might actually make it worse, but there's always going to be a piece. He's never going to be on the sidelines. He's always going to be in the action some way, somehow. And that's typically how I play a lot of, or any character that I'm going to play or, you know, main characters that I might write in a story uh, or even uh, secondary characters. There's going to be that support system where they're all intertwined in a way that no one really takes a sideline. Like, they have something to contribute all the time, good or bad. <laughs> yeah, I, you, character development, I guess, in the terms of game, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've, I kind of always play the same kind of character. And so it, to me, it's just, I, I agree with Matt in the sense that it's all about having fun. I want to pick a character that's fun to play uh, uh, because I, I, I want to derive some joy out of it. And for me, it, it, I, I'm, I'm very chaotic in the way that I like to play. I'm not going to go straight to something. I want to, I want to find a way around things um, when it comes to uh, really sort of frustrating the DM is almost a goal of mine uh, on a daily basis. Uh, asking questions, <laughs> no, no, no point uh spending 30 uh or spending several hours of our gameplay just shopping trying to convince them <laughs> that uh i shouldn't have uh, stuff like that so I, I think those characters i think for me character to, one of the my favorite characters i developed was a, a a dragon for a story that i would tell my son when he was a kid growing up and uh, had a lot of uh, years to develop that character every night in these stories. And I really loved uh, Clinton, the dragon. I actually got the tattoo on my arm uh, because I, we, it was a story that Jude and I, when he was a little kid, worked on together. And so I think, you know, outside of gameplay, that, that dragon character we developed is, is probably my favorite. Uh, it's the mix between a red fire breathing dragon and a blue water dragon. So it's a blue fire breathing dragon. And in this world, uh, there were only four kinds of dragons and they weren't allowed to interbreed. And so uh, we had the whole uh, um, mixed race dragon uh, who became a friend with my son's character. So it was a lot of fun to develop Clinton and the castles, his house. So.
uh, as for me, my favorite character that I've made would be a chaotic good fire mage named Phoenix. And the only reason he's named that is because our DM made the mistake of letting us give our character one special ability with no strings attached. So, yeah. Mine was, if I ever died, I'd just explode into fire and then immediately come back at half health. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. I'm jealous. That's a good character. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I just have yeah. a lot of fun creating a bunch of chaos. So I'll just go in and I'll be like, hey, there's TNT. Okay. I'll back, bring that with me. Zach, hold on. So you always come back at half health. What if you die twice in a row? You can just keep coming back so you can't die? Well, I come back, but every consecutive time I come back, I lose, I get minus on my stats till my next long rest. <laughs> it's like, so, you, yeah, know what, no, you know what kind of idiot I'd be if I knew I couldn't die? <laughs> yeah. No, so by like, and it was, that a, way anyway. a, it was like a 50% penalty. So by the second time, I was just completely useless. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I couldn't move for an X amount of time, but it was really good because I'd just blow up and take out everything near me mm. and I'd be like, okay, That's things are fun now. So I just, <laughs> and I was obviously chaotic. I was chaotic good. So I was like, hey, why do we need to, you know, ask them to let us in? We can just run up to the gate and blow it up and then we're in the town. <laughs> but I just have fun with those kind of yeah. characters, just definite on the good side where it's like hey that lord is stealing from people and we've been tasked to get taxes from him or whatever but let's not go up to his door and get it let's uh, blow up half of his house and then ask him for it nicely <laughs> i like it definitely chaotic <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah just having a lot of fun doing just making my party kind of lose their head. Mm. That's my favorite. Because they're like, hey, we should uh, not go down that cave because it's deadly. And I'm like, let's go. I'm already carrying a torch leading the way. Is <laughs> Leroy take... Jenkins over there? Yeah. <laughs> right. I just charged right into danger. Mm. And it's so, I just, that's the kind of characters that I like to, I'll just have fun. Just Leroy Jenkins running. Mm. To regret it later. <laughs> yeah, I can appreciate it. I think that's a good example of a DM doing the yes, but uh, here are your consequences. Um, but that, that's good. That's why I guess I, a good warning to any DM out there be careful with those no strings attached clauses because the players will wreck your game. <laughs> They'll wreck your game even with. Out you offering them anything extra they'll just do it um as far as like favorite character that i've created that's that's tough um at this point in my adult life anyway i've dm'd more than i've played or maybe it's yeah it's probably it's got to be more at this point um so a lot of the characters that i create for basically npcs they're just there to move the plot along. And there's, you know, little bits of fun here and there. Um, the character that I played the longest was a character called Windorun, which is an NPC in the current campaign. Uh, but he was a kind of a homebrew warlock before warlocks were actually a, a viable class. Uh, something that uh, Justin, one of uh, David and my uh, gaming buddies, it was a character class that he and his former DM had created and he offered that as uh, a possible character class when I rolled into his his, uh, his campaign, and it was more more like a sorcerer. But instead of being able to basically learn magic, you had to go find a certain component and absorb the energy from that component to produce a spell out of it. So it was a lot more complications and difficult to find some new spells. Um, but yeah, he was definitely chaotic, more of a chaotic neutral. Uh, we basically got invited to, or I don't remember, we were at a wedding, I think, and we decided that we didn't like the people, so we teleported the entire cathedral to the plane of fire, except for the bride. We left her with a chest full of jewels at her feet, 
where the palace was and just like, yeah, yeah, they're all dead now. Let's go. So yeah, it, he had a, a few <laughs> moments of like, nah, I don't like this. Let's burn it all down. <laughs> Maybe part of my, you know, being a firebug as a child kind of coming out. But yeah, that's uh, nothing too specific. Awesome. Oh, uh, for me, I think my favorite character, um, uh, it's been recent because, you know, we started playing uh, D&D again the last couple of years, but <clears throat> was my favorite character that I've developed uh, anyways uh, is, uh, has to be uh, Sonia and she's a, uh, she's a barbarian. Um, her backstory is super cool um, just because it's kind of an amalgamation of a lot of my favorite films. So like Highlander and Conan the Barbarian and uh, those types of things. And so she's like kind of like the best of all those worlds and also the worst. Um, uh, I think my favorite thing about her is she's super chaotic. I guess we're all chaotic folks uh, <laughs> on the call today. So, um, but uh, my favorite thing about her is she's just free. So she, is, you know, she has that uh, rocket raccoon mindset of, you know, um, oh, I want that, so I'll take it. And no, no, you don't understand, sir. But I, I want it more than they do, right? Type of an idea, and so it's okay for her. And she has this die um, that she utilizes. Oh, I don't have my dice, and it's a, uh, it's a th the theft die. Whether or not I should steal something, and it's a glass. It's like a green kind of jade looking kind of dice, or die, and it has zero pips on it. So when I roll it. I'm stealing something, right? <laughs> uh, and so uh, she's been a lot of fun. Now I've actually drilled one pip into it, um, uh, you know, for us, for her. So there's like a one out of six chance she's not going to steal something because uh, she's trying to grow, right? Um, and uh, but she's she's fun because there's just no rules with the way I play her. Um, you know, if you don't talk bad about me, um, you know, while you're eating a sandwich, <laughs> or you'll 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 rule the day, right? And uh, and it's, she's a lot of fun because she's just so freeing. Um, a character that I'm, I'm, I was been working on for a long time. It's kind of cool that Charlie was talking about Clinton the Dragon. But, um, when Samara was born, um, uh, I made up a, a character called Samara Samurai. And uh, so she's like this uh, samurai girl, right, growing up. And I have these little short stories written about her, which are a lot of fun. And she hangs out with uh, with Master Jude, which is, uh, you know, Charlie's, uh, Charlie's son because they were – you know, so close uh, in age together. So I have these cool stories about them going on adventures. Um, kind of like I did when I was, as a kid, I wrote stories about uh, these two guys called Lemon and Froggy. Um, and so I got <laughs> Lemon and Froggy clean the bedroom or Lemon and Froggy, you know, go to the football game or whatever. Um, and so those are um, probably some of my favorite characters ever. So for D&D, definitely Sonya. And then uh, uh, just writing wise, uh, those other characters. Um, I think it's cool though how, how we all like that whole um, let's just cause as much possible <laughs> chaos in the game as we possibly can and wreck all the all the DM's plans uh, and make them play catch up with us right mm. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't had a chance to DM yet but I'm sure that'll come back and bite me uh, sometime when I get a chance to do that yes, especially if I let Matt and Charlie <laughs> play all the time <laughs> All the time. <laughs> it's it's just the I... way it goes, man. <laughs> if, 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 as soon as you start DMing, you realize all the kind of jackass things you did <laughs> as a player. Like, oh, I'm paying for that now. Well, I think if in, in my only, in my campaign, my first campaign, everyone's going to be mute, right? <laughs> <laughs> we can speak. <laughs> Nobody will play. You think that's a good idea? <laughs> well, I can yeah, you're right. Somebody will find a not. way around that. There's always a way. <laughs> oh <true>. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Guess, so, oh yeah, go ahead, Alan. I guess if their their IQ or their intelligence is low enough, they can't even speak anyway. Like. I think there is actually a rule like in D and D, like once you get below a certain level, all you can do is communicate in grunts and gestures. Yeah, because uh, a, oh, a, a member of our party, that, yeah, that happened to Fableton one time. Yeah, he got um, feeble-minded, so yeah, and my character of Horosin had to just take care of him and basically we built a backpack for for Fableton to ride on. <laughs> he just rode my backpack drooling all the time. Yeah, it was really interesting. <laughs> you know, that's my favorite. Part of the character development though especially with like the D, D or different role-playing games is that freedom to continue to grow the character as long as the dm or whoever is telling the story is willing 
you know, because when that happened, I mean, essentially, you know, for those that don't know D&D, your character at that point is pretty useless to um, the party. So in that case, I met with the DM separately and we worked out a plan. Just so happened, we, my kids were watching, oh, I can't remember the, the cartoon movie it was about the girls. She got the little personality characters, anger and happiness. In, yeah, Inside, inside out. out. Yeah. Inside yeah. Out. Uh, and I'm a huge Green Lantern fan. So I took those two ideas, put them together and worked with the DM to say, hey, in his own mind, we have all these different Fabletons happening and trying to jockey for control. Can we do that? So we had a little side quest going on at the same time, trying to bring him back to the party. So the the character growth and the, the unknown for me, when you talk about characters, as far as writing and as far as uh, playing, that creative piece is really what I'm most drawn to because it's it's never boring, right? There's always something you can add to or an idea you can do. Sometimes the bad part is you get too caught up in that and then you always want to change and do something else and change this and change that and change this. But you know, in that one specific moment, it, it just worked out um, and it, it was a lot of fun to play through. Awesome. All right. So uh, my next question to have. Um, so thinking about that favorite character, right? And if you had to introduce that character to the world and you could choose uh, any media to do that. So whether that's comics or games, movies, cartoons, podcasts, uh, literary prose, whatever. Um, how would you take that character and introduce them into the world? If you had unlimited funds, um, you know, it, uh, just... Uh, your own creative imagination. How would you bring that character to life so others could enjoy that that character? So I would I would actually use Clinton the the story that Jude and I wrote, and I think I think it would be a cool movie series. I, it, it parallels. So if I had unlimited funds, I, I would get uh, I would you know blow up multi million dollar production and and have uh, a film series based on that with looking at at least three films, three movies that would tell the story of, of Clinton and, and uh, the, the world of dragons. I think it would be with all, all of the special effects, it could be pretty uh, epically beautiful and tragic at the same time and have a, a lot of neat elements. I think it would need better writing. I would hire better writers to help me take the concept to uh, places um, and just, you know, that kind of stuff. So, a movie would be the medium for me because I love movies so much. I, I think it would be a good book and I like books. I love to read. I think reading's uh, great, but I think you reach a, a broader audience with movie. Um, so that's where I'd go. So David, it's funny because you say, what would you do to introduce? I've already introduced Fableton to the world several different ways. Um, a couple of years back during our orientation, uh, I actually in Fableton's character and voice and personality uh, read a poem out loud to everybody. And I've introduced multiple people. Dr. Huber one time, uh, one year for each orientation, introduced him as Fableton in his voice uh, to the student body coming into Shriner. Um, Dom Mason, another person uh, that works at Shriner, uh, ex-student now alumni that we play D&D with, he was doing a, a comedy bit at Pite and Plow in Kerrville, and I introduced him as Fableton in my Fableton voice <laughs> up to the stage. So I try to take advantage of that anytime I can, uh, if you know, as appropriate to kind of break the ice using Fableton in that way. So he's actually become kind of my alter ego tool set to be able to pull out as needed. Um, but I'm really into podcasts. I like podcast stories, Critical Role. Like I'm a huge follower of that. Just their their concept and how they uh, structure. Uh, that interaction with their audience, uh, I think I'd probably go that direction uh, with trying to introduce Fableton into some type of storytelling, role-playing type of world, whatever that might be, you know, maybe some literature. Uh, I keep track of any poems or things that come to mind as a Fableton character would. Uh, I'm probably, I don't know, six to eight poems uh, uh, deep uh, of just sitting down and writing out, you know, different literature pieces. So I kind of really take ownership of that piece of the character and just write um so probably between literature and podcasting is how i would is the direction i'd probably go uh as for my character i would probably 
go with a book series just because I like I enjoy writing fiction and I really that's the only way that I can see introducing this character to the world would be through a book series like I just can't imagine any other way yeah um sorry were you was that it i'm sorry yeah that's it <laughs> okay. you're good sorry <laughs> um i was pretty torn i'm kind of torn between doing um uh, either animation or uh just a straight up graphic novel with winterun uh mostly and not really a story about winterun himself because winterun is part of a larger group so it'd be the story of that you know his family his education his his siblings who kind of go adventuring together um i think that graphic novels uh do kind of bridge a lot between having something literary to read and also having something that's also very visual that you can kind of hide a lot of details in the background and give a uh, very specific action to the words you're writing down so i think uh, that's my my impetus for like uh, the idea of a graphic novel versus uh, either movie or uh, straight up uh, novels. Cool. All right, for me, I think um, uh, I would with well the way Sonia is uh, would definitely have to be a movie. Um, and she probably I want to only make one movie. Uh, let's just be honest, because after a while, her tactics are basically the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. But if I could have any uh, any amount of money to do that obviously i'm going to go talk to disney and say hey disney uh, i know you have all the money on the planet and uh you can basically hire whoever you want to do whatever you want whenever you want so i need you uh to get me a couple of directors lined out for me and writers and i would have uh taku watiti and um james gunn basically do my do my story right and so uh, the, I think it would be super cool to sit down with those guys and like, look, this is my character. I know she's pretty simple, right? Um, but as far as, you know, her tactics go, but her back, here's her backstory. Um, can you guys tell an amazing, uh, you know, two and a half hour uh, origin story uh, with this character? And it, it would probably be unbelievably cool, right? Mm. Um because uh, I like those two directors quite a lot in the way that they approach filmmaking. Um, you know, we talked a couple nights ago on comics and comic movies and things like that. And uh, I think almost everybody in our panel agreed that Thor Ragnarok was probably one of their favorites, if not their favorite. Um, and just the way that he developed, because uh, Thor's character really in the, in all of the, the comics, he wasn't, I mean, it was kind of like, a, yeah, he's the powerful hammer swinging dude you know i mean his it, some of his independent movies were they were okay um but uh to take that character and give him so much depth and uh and, and i guess creativity and his backstory and stuff like that and what, watch him grow and he he uses that that cockiness um that he had in the first film and you know makes it instead of being his downfall like it was with his dad it's like kind of more of his saving grace uh in, in the new film right and i think that Sonia feels a lot like that. Um, is that uh, she's super confident, maybe too confident <laughs> for her own good. Um, and uh, I think they do a great job of of developing characters in that way. So I'd probably go movies, and uh, of course there's got to be an action figure line, right? Um, so it's, I want to be, I want to have my own action figure one day. Uh, it's because they were a big influence to me when I was growing up. Was was my toys? I still I still have all of them. Uh, so that type of thing. Um, and so I guess that's the way I would go. Disney all the way. I would sell out to the corporate moguls <laughs> and uh, get that movie in every home on the planet. All right. So um, we're, we're coming up on pretty close to, to the hour. It's, it's, uh, we've got about five or six minutes left. Um, is there any parting thoughts on what you guys would like to, to give to someone who may be just getting into uh, the gaming world are just getting started uh, when they're uh, developing a character or if they're choosing a character that um, they want to to be like or whatever uh, what kind of advice would you guys give to them as seasoned veterans of character development so i, I i'm probably the even even being older than zach i mean i've played dungeons and dragons but i might be the 
the rookie here in, in all of this uh, D and D world. And the one thing that I have enjoyed is playing in multiple campaigns and really sticking to one character that I can develop and, and sort of infuse a personality into at least early on. And, and I appreciate that how we're in several different games or playing in, in and choosing it. Now I've ventured off in our most recent uh, trying to play someone completely different and it's difficult for me because I, I have those tendencies to want to go back to the other character. Uh, I'm playing a good character for the first time. Uh, I'm always chaotic, neutral, chaotic, evil, actually. And so I think that <laughs> playing a, a, a good character has been tough, but having that, you know, having a, uh, especially when, cause there's so many other things to learn in D and D there's a lot of detail. Uh, uh, I think if you're just getting started, pick something easy and stick with it for a couple of campaigns um, and, and have fun with that. that. That'd be my best advice. Cause I'm, I'm relatively new too. So that, that, that might be the best I could say. Uh, I would say it's very overwhelming to start your first D and D campaign and going through everything or just any character creation and kind of figuring out what, you know, you want to do, what you want them to look like, what personality you want them to have, just what, even what you want them to do, like archer, mage, swords person, small goblin that runs around and just charismas everyone, you know, but it is, once you figure out what clicks with you, it's probably one of the most fun things you will ever do, just straight up it's one of the most especially if you have a good group of friends that you're doing it with it's one of the best things that you'll ever do pretty excited now that charisma is now a verb in the lexicon uh, so thank you for that zach um as far as creating your character i don't think you really do too much wrong um if you're stuck steal and break everything Find a character you like in fiction, take it, rip it apart, and put it back together the way you want it. Make your character that way. Um, and also, you don't have to just play D&D. There are tons of games out there who, with people who want to play them. You just have to find them, and thanks to you know the interwebs, we can find each other. Um, but yeah, just get in there, make some mistakes, put in a few flaws, because those are where the characters, to me, shine. And play those up and give your character a chance to grow. I think that's the best advice I can give you. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, we, we spent a little bit of time talking about D&D, but I think it kind of goes to any type of character development you want to make, right? You know, kind of, you know, seek out, you know, just really just you put pen to paper and just start writing. Uh, you'll start to see patterns uh, and commonalities across kind of your interests uh, steal, right? I think Alan's right. You know, you're not really stealing. A lot of characters over time are very similar in nature, but there's different differences a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, take a couple of characters, push them all together, see what comes out, you know, put your own, you know, your own thumbprint on it at that point. Um, but really just, just right. Um, you know, there's no wrong, right? It's uh, it's one of the, the most beautiful things I think with creating a character is that, there is no wrong, <laughs> right? There's only growth for the character, you know, and then for you as the writer going into it, because there's not like a definitive end, like this is the way it always has to be. No, like you can, you can scratch something out, you can change it, you can, you know, you can add to it, you can adapt, um, you know, character creation for me is a really cool thing because that creative piece does come out. Um, so anybody, you know, attempting to make a character or jump into writing or uh, a role-playing type of game or whatever, just you know you can just do it uh, for me starting off you know uh, I kind of joked around saying you know hey is like an extension of myself uh, I kind of was you know I, t I, I picked and choose different aspects of myself that I wanted to and you know enhance bigger than life you know because I know I can't do that in the real world right because you know a lot of it's inappropriate so um, <laughs> you know I started there and then kind of just kept developing it from there and added here it took away from there and before you know it um, but the greatest thing about it is there's no end uh, it only ends when you want it to end. So you can continue to add or, or take away. Uh, you can file it away, come back to it later. You take that idea and you can add it to a different character. Uh, I have another character I play named Grayson. 
uh, within a, a leadership role-playing game that myself and Jake Carley developed, right? And uh, there's very similarities between the two characters, but at the same time, they're absolutely two different characters, but they're very charisma-based. So you know, I take the idea of charisma being my, uh, my grounding point, and then I just develop out from there. You know, so I think everybody has their own style of how to do it. Um, you know, just don't be afraid to start, I think is probably my best uh, advice I could give anybody. Yeah, cool. Um, I think for me too, it's, um, I like to play a character that um, is different than everybody else who's, who's on in the party usually. Uh, so my first, um, in thinking about d and I know our conversations kind of hit went that way a lot, but a favorite character that I've, or the first character I ever introduced uh, when I started playing is uh, a character called Paddlejack. Um, and uh, Paddlejack's whole thing is um, he's, a, he, I volunteered to be a slave uh, to the other two uh, players in our campaign because I, I didn't know how Dungeons and Dragons worked really. I didn't play it since I was a little kid and uh, man, that was before Geez, I guess that was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons last time I played. That's a long time ago, for those of you in the know. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't know what I was doing, and I knew I was going like, to make a lot of mistakes, and I, was gonna, I needed to be quiet and learn. So I, I created a character that had no choice but to do that because he was a servant to the other players. And so um, now he, has his, he has his motives and the things that drives him, um, and there's certain things that he wants to, to, to be able to do um, as part of the backstory because I always like to have some kind of a – uh, I guess, you know, motive that helps me drive my character uh, to do what it is I'm doing. Um, but what's so fun about it is uh, the, the, the players, when I first came in and introduced myself, they're like, wait a second, you're, you voluntarily made yourself like subservient to our characters. It's like, yeah, because I don't know what I'm doing. And you guys are going to teach me a lot. Uh, so that was, that was a kind of an interesting way to do that. Um, and it's a character I really like a whole lot, and I, I enjoy playing him. Uh, he doesn't fit in all campaigns um, just because of the way our campaign is. But parts of him uh, are in are in every character that I develop. Um, so that's whether I'm writing or not. I like the uh, I like the characters that will uh, out of nowhere, you know, give you this big aha type of uh, scenario. Like, oh wow, I didn't know that your character was about that. Um, so I like the surprise factor, which is. Well, I try, I try to do the adapt a character that I already know type of a thing. I tried to do that with uh, with the Wolverine and uh, and one of my characters. I tried Nightcrawler, but I can't play those characters like they are in the in the comics because there's so many limitations in D and D to make it fair. <laughs> Whatever DMs, uh, my character should have five attacks and six bonus attacks because he's Nightcrawler. You can't hit him, but whatever. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> but but I also find <laughs> also find I that. Am. I feel you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. But my personality ends up kind of infusing into the growth of the character and the character typically ends up becoming me later on anyways, just with these cool powers. And so, um, you know, if you start with that way, or maybe you, you get with your DM and push it that way, uh, either way is fine. I just want, um, yeah, I would say my biggest advice is just play something that's going to be fun that you're going to enjoy playing all the time. That you could, uh, if you had to play two, three days in a row, you'd be like, "Oh yeah, I want to play this character again," uh, just because that's something that you've you've done in your life. Um, um, <clears throat> so I guess uh, that's our character corner. So I, I want to say thank you to everybody who was on. It puts us at seven o'clock, so that's the end of our show. Um, so special thanks to to Zach uh, Purcell. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Special thank you to me. Alan Minder. Appreciate you being here, sir. And of course, uh, my fabulous co-host, right, Doctors uh, Goodwin and Uber. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, you'll catch us uh, again tomorrow night uh, at six o'clock, right here on Facebook Live on the SU Money page. And if you guys could remind me what the topic is tomorrow, is that books tomorrow? Books. Books. Awesome. That's going to be a great one, guys. Uh, we have one of our professors. Uh, from the university, Dr. William Woods uh, is going to be on. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, so we'll see you guys tomorrow at six. Um, you can check us out on YouTube, too. If you, if you missed the beginning, check out the rest there. All right, everybody, have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir.